Hi, Nicholas. Hey. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, thank you for having me, buddy. Yeah, uh, I invite you to share your screen, and the stage will be yours for 25 minutes, including questions. Awesome. Right. Um, yeah, yeah and I, I, when I find the button, I will tell you that um, people have implemented Fire on Firebase. Um, <laughs> okay. So you can be Firebase on Firebase. Yeah, my joke yes. was, a, was a real use case. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah. All right, sweet. <laughs> here. Oh, yeah, some fire. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so here's a, here's a fire joke. Um, this is Graham Grieve, the creator of fire, uh, looking very cut on the beach. So uh, Shelby gave a great presentation and, um, you know, I wanted to, I, I think a lot of what she said rings true with me that this is not really like fundamentally um, a technology problem or anything. It's more of getting companies to see APIs as products and think about them strategically. Um, by extension, developer experience really suffers because of that in healthcare. Uh, it's you know basically not a thing. And I'm going to highlight a little bit of <laughs> what's bad out there. Uh, it'll be a little fun, um, you know, public shaming, and then um, talk a little bit about what's changing with these new federal API requirements and where I think things will go. Kind of, I have a little framework I'll introduce. Um, and finally, uh, you know, I hope to end with a jolt of optimism. So uh, I think everyone can be an agent of change in this world of healthcare. And um, depending on who you are, uh, I think there's there's things you can offer. So um, I think a lot of people at this conference might be in infrastructure and API technology, and you're selling into healthcare, you're building for healthcare. Um, I think that developer experience, developer relations is a really compelling sales story to tell. Um, and just you know, help helping people use those tools to, to to build seamless developer experiences will be such a huge win. Um, there is going to be a lot of money spent on building APIs in the next few years, um, and let's let's get them to buy the right tools and do it right. Um, if you're new to healthcare, maybe you're kind of checking out the, the talks to see um, if this is something exciting. Yeah, we need you. It's really exciting. It's awesome. I've been a healthcare developer for ten years. Um, you feel really smart <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, we, we, we need uh, people from outside who have especially have worked on APIs um, in other industries and, and are sort of well versed in REST, sort of a new thing in healthcare. Um, and then if you're a healthcare developer already, you know, we love you. Um, but I'm shaming a few of, few of you, especially EHR developers in this talk. Um, and with the shaming, you know, I, I really fundamentally believe this. Um, that interoperability is not a technical problem. Like if we had, uh, if there was any industry where there's the smartest concentration of people, it's healthcare. Um, the AHL seven standards are really, really comprehensive and, and like you can do anything you want with them. Um, and you, the, even those standards that Shelby mentioned from the nineties are really powerful and then do a lot of things. Um, but the reason you don't see them everywhere and the reason it's not just turnkey is because it's cultural and business model. Um, it's just kind of the unfortunate way things have played out, but uh, we'll see if we can change that. So uh, like I mentioned, I've been in healthcare technology for 10 years. I started at Epic and I've been at Redox since 2014. And uh, back in my, my first job at Epic, um, things were a lot different. So there is there has been a lot of progress the first thing that just is crazy to me is that HL7 specs, so these, again, these 90 specs and these 2000 specs, um, they were behind a paywall. <laughs> Essentially, you had to join the standards organization. This is the way X12 still works, by the way, um, if you wanna do claims. The um, the, the membership fee is, is about the same as it is now. It's like $1,000 know, per person. So to, to even like play the game, you had to pay upfront. Um, the first sort of like I, I, you know what I would call a real API experience like you'd see in another industry was Athena's more disruption please program, kind of like an app store model that came out in 2011 uh, and it sort of developed from there. Um, at the time, the new crazy hotness, which is now like finally coming into a, a nationwide network, is a combination of SOAP, um, this terrible thing called EBXML uh, for, for sort of a registry information model and CDA, which is an, another HL7 standard for giant documents. Um, so if you do any kind of like document-based exchange, 
Uh, this all started back then, and everybody was really excited about it. A modern developer who's a fan of JSON over XML and REST over SOAP um, would probably just like grimace. But um, finally, patient authorized things was just not a thought at all. Um, there were patient portals kind of written into the, the federal regulations at the time, but APIs for patients was not talked about at all. Um, so where are we today? The API rules um, that Shelby alluded to, they actually started in 2015. So the, the federal government has this you know, sort of power to incentivize software developers in the EHR space to do certain things. And now CMS does a certain power too. Um, they, they came out with this rule in 2015 and it wasn't like necessarily required to be implemented until 2018 or 2019, uh, saying that you have to have APIs for patients. And they didn't specify a specific standard. They just kind of said, hey, do this, get certified, show you so you can do it. Um, and then a few things, they had to put a URL to their public documentation and sort of their terms. So you can go onto the ONC website and look at the certified EHR product list. Um, and this is kind of what the page looks like. And you can go through all the vendors and click on their documentation. So when you do that, uh, you get to some, some fun developer experience no -nos. Um So first, some of them just don't work. Um, yeah, the, there's there's really not a process for for reporting these or, or getting these people in trouble. And these are you know smaller vendors too. I wouldn't worry about it too much. But on the same coin, you know this EHR vendor could have my health data that I need to you know take with me. Could have my child. It could have my my parents. Um, so it is it is kind of um, concerning and and you know almost um, disheartening when you see that. But you know, so, some people are doing better. Some people have active links. Um, so I'm just go to a Confluence page that you need to log in for. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen the WAP video, but it's just that WAP. What? <laughs> um, so yeah, that one's fun. Um, if you get past that, you might get a PDF. Um, and the, the here's sort of the onboarding workflow for this one. Um, I'll let you read it for a little bit, but from a high level, you know, I don't want to mock people's use of the English language, but they have a DLL. So that's great. You know, if you're um, a Windows developer and to sort of get onboarded, you should call a phone number and talk to them. Um, and, you know, I, 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 wonder, I worry about the complexity of their, uh, their client secrets when you're giving them over the phone. Um, yeah, you're definitely not going to get 64 bits of entropy there. So you find this. Um, and finally, I, I, there's there's some bigger vendors out there who, who do things uh, not so great as well. Um, this was when I tried to sign up for a patient portal development account. Um, I got an email saying my app was rejected because uh, they own, they, they, there's no testing available. Um, I intend, you know, the exact language is I intend to perform testing. So they're, they're only for production. Okay. Just go straight into production. Um, don't work with our APIs otherwise. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty abysmal, um, out there today. Like I mentioned though, the, the rules are changing. So the, the final rule was published this year. Um, this is part of the, you know, sometimes people refer to it as the cures act. So it was part of 21st century cures. Um, the, the high level change here is that the ONC is requiring all these EHR vendors to use fire and use a specific implementation guide of fire. So things should get a lot more standardized. Um, and then CMS, uh, which Shelby mentioned, uh, is requiring insurance companies who provide plans that are backed by the federal government. So basically most insurance companies to do something like blue button 2.0, where patients can get their data uh, in the sort of an OAuth, you know, patient authorized way. Um, so it is kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're continuing to push forward. Um, I, I wanted to just speculate a little bit on what to expect from, from the developer experience. And this is kind of my framework. So uh, the, the, the sort of left hand column here will be a developer experience thing. That's just sort of a general good idea. Um, then I'm going to you know, meditate on like, is it required? Do these people have to do it just 
out of the box to get certified. Um, the incentivize to do it is much more like Shelby was mentioning where, you know, do these, do, will these vendors see the API as a product um, and will they want to put money behind these things to sort of make it more successful? And then finally, I just meditate on whether or not it's a hard thing to do. So first, let's, let's talk about that 404 page. Um, I'll call that performance. Um, you know, in the developer experience world, if I'm evaluating a product, I, I like to see the status page, uh, you know, being there. I like to have notifications when things are down. Um, you know, if you use GitHub, uh, things, have, things have changed a lot since Microsoft bought them and there's just kind of outages all the time, but at least I tell you and then you can get auto, automatic notifications. Um, this is sort of required by the regs, so either you can get penalized if your APIs are down um, in, in ways that are not uh, sort of pre-planned. Um, as a, a vendor, for that reason, you're sort of incentivized to, to worry about this. Um, there is kind of more penalties and, and sort of a stick rather than carrot things coming for people who don't have their APIs up. Um, of course, this is really hard. This is one of the hardest things to do in software engineering um, is just keep a service running. And um, again, going back to the, the people who are in infrastructure, um, you know, maybe selling into healthcare, uh, this is a huge thing you can lean on, right? Um, dig into the federal rules and you can read about sort of the, the performance exception to information blocking. Um, it, it's kind of interesting stuff. Um, so then let's let's talk about support. Um, so you know again, me me calling that phone number to get my access token. Um, a really good developer experience provides developers great support, tutorials, education. Um, this is not explicitly required by the regs. In fact, the opposite is true. Um, the regs allow an EHR vendor to charge extra for support. Um, so there's sort of base level price expectations written into the rules. You can't sort of price gouge because you have access to the data, um, but support is something that is not really covered. Um, and again, you know, you're only really incentivized to do it uh, if you can charge for it, right? So it creates this kind of conundrum, and I don't think this is something that's gonna get better necessarily uh, with the new regs. Um, and of course, this is a very hard thing to do for any API company. Um, there, there is sort of a big gap though, I think, um, in where we are with EHR vendors today and what you'd see from sort of say like one of the really, you know, glamorous API companies. Um, I, I challenge you to find a EHR vendor who has a YouTube tutorial on how to connect to their API, for example. Um, okay, let's go to that one where I got rejected, my app got rejected because I wanted to do some testing with sandboxes. <laughs> um, you know, in general, um, sandboxes are uh, a great developer experience thing that when they have realistic examples and you can, ideally you can even hit them and query them without too much effort, um, you know, a few minutes maybe to get an access token or uh, maybe there's even a public version where you can just go hit. This is not required by the regulations at all. Um, again, just having a PDF is still sort of par for the course. Um, Again, it's, there's really no incentive, um, again, unless I, I'm sort of getting a, a, a product out of the API uh, for my company, I'm not really incentivized to stand up a sandbox, right? I'm just kind of doing the bare minimum to meet these regulations and nothing else. Um, and then in, is it hard? You know, I think this is a tricky one. Um, there's a great open source tool called Cynthia, um, spelled like that that can generate fake data. So it's sort of a, a statistically realistic patient population you can create in fire format already. Um, there's a few limitations though. I mean, it's not every resource. So for example, um, you know, Shelby works in claims, um, an explanation of benefit resources that doesn't generate those. So someone would have to go and do a PR to do that, um, which would be very useful. But again, it, it, you know, it sort of needs realistic data to, to make it feel real. Um, the other big thing about healthcare is that it's real time. So at Redox, we do a lot of real time data transmissions. So you know, sub second notification that a patient has arrived, 
um, for an appointment or, you know, we were doing a lot of COVID testing right now. So um, we can transmit those results as soon as they're sort of clicked in the system, the lab system. Um, that's really hard to do with, syn with, with synthetic data, right? You, you need to orchestrate a lot of moving pieces and kind of tell a story of a patient um, as they move through the health system. Uh, so you, you almost need to be like a screenwriter to do that, right? Finally, um, I don't have a good example for this, except for this one, but um, one of the things that's gonna happen is, is your fire is going to become the, the requirement. Um, there's, still, there's gonna be a lot of choices that implementers make when they implement fire. Um, this is a very large EHR vendors documentation. And this is the device R4 version and the patient R4 version. And they just have like XML for one and JSON for the other. Um, I'm pretty sure you can, you know, use the headers and fire to, to control uh, which one you get for this particular vendor. But um, just having the documentation mixed like that is, is a developer experience no-no. So what the goal of, of using Fire would be to have this consistent experience across all of my different resources, all my different endpoints uh, as a vendor. Um, the regulations only go so far to controlling this. So um, you know, I encourage everyone to look up the US core profile. Check me out on YouTube too. I have a bunch of uh, talks about this stuff. But once you go sort of beyond the, these very few requirements, like um, for example, a patient should have a race documented um, and a you know a sex documented. Um, it, it's sort of open season for what vendors can do. Um, again, this one, the incentives are really around getting certified and getting that software out into the world. Um, again, because the, the customers of these EHR vendors need this to to get incentivized by the government. Um, so, really thinking holistically about, hey, is this going to be a very interoperable solution or is this a good design decision um, are sort of secondary to just getting it out the door. Um, and I don't think this is really hard to do, right? If you um, if you really like take it seriously, um, I think you need to engage with the FIRE community. Shelby mentioned that. Um, I'd encourage everyone to sort of check it out, see what you can do and study the best practices that are out there. So, you know, um, in developer experience, you can definitely get very far by just copying what others are doing. Um, this is a good place to start if you kind of have no idea uh, what to do. So I want to leave everybody with a little bit of optimism. Um, there's hope. Shelby mentioned Blue Button. I think this is a really great example in healthcare of uh, Awesome developer experience. I went last night, signed up for an account, um, had an access token, and was able to, you know, see the sandbox in five minutes. Um, this is the front page of their site. You know, it's the two things I care about the most: um, the sandbox, and I'm on the API docs already. So, you know, getting to getting to all the stuff I need to do to actually get developing um, quickly. They do a great job of that, um, and the documentation is really good as well. Um, fire, you know, is the, the, the real difference with fire is, is that it's a license under creative commons. Um, the, the world that I started in where these specs, you know, just even the specs themselves cost money to, to read, um, is, a, is a long gone thing now. Um, you know, I think Graham, the, the, the creator of fire, uh, he refers to this as like the treasure. It's the public, it's a public good. And, Long after, um, you know, maybe the, the, the hype around fire dies out, uh, we still have this and anyone can sort of take it and modify it. And it's on GitHub too. So I, I, I have one PR against fire, uh, just fixed some documentation, but that's, that's really powerful, right? That's something that has not happened in healthcare up till now. Um, and it's really exciting. And finally, um, yeah, I mean, Redux, I think we do cool work. So check us out if you need help connecting to different legacy systems um, or even public health agencies. Uh, one of our really awesome partners right now, Curative, has just tweeted out that they've done 3.9% of all COVID 
tests, and we've been wiring them up to all, all the public health agencies. Um, the um, the bad stuff I showed for EHR vendors, you know, might apply to public health agencies as well. Um, they all sort of have different things: SFTP, CSV, SOAP. Um, so it's definitely not a uh, definitely not a walk in the park. So this is what I wanted to cover. Um, you know, developer experience has some real challenges in healthcare. Um, the last five years, especially, have been really exciting though to see where things are going. And I think that if you're looking to jump into healthcare or you're selling into healthcare right now, um, it's it's a really exciting time. And I'll leave you with one meme. Um, this is from my colleague Brendan Keeler. Um, again. Focusing on that that idea that Shelby had, um, where the API is not really seen as a part of the product, um, that a lot of these EHR systems um, they they kind of function as billing systems. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you for this overview, uh, uh, you know, about developer experience. We have time for uh, just one question, but that that would be. Uh, to your mind, when there is a, a regulation, when there is a uh, let's say uh, some interoperability as as a goal, how what's the really the degrees of liberties of a comp of a company in their developer experience? How far they can go to uh, to actually be, to deliver better services, but all keeping the spirit of the regulation? Yeah, I mean, um, there, there's nothing in the regulations that say you can't provide an awesome developer experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Everything is just about going above and beyond though. And again, it goes back to sort of this fundamental like business model question, right? Is an API helping you grow your business? Is it scaling with your company? Um, Athena, who I called out, called out you know, they make a lot of their money off of the actual processing of the claims. So they're not, they're more upfront about being a billing system. Um, so having more cleaner data come in through the APIs actually helps them and helps their, their business process become more efficient. But most of most of the systems just don't have that, so I think that's the real challenge. Is just sort of the business model part of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, and we can go on the uh, on the uh, Redux or Redux Engine to know more about uh, what you do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for being part of this healthcare healthcare track.